There may not be a singular book of Joseph, but the largest narrative of Genesis covers Joseph in the book. This tells us that such an account carries great significance and as such is worth a special observance. Within Genesis chapters 37 to 50, we will discover the patterns of God's work through his providence and his promises for his people, all of which are interwoven through human fallenness, failures, and betrayal. Which means this, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. This is the picture and power of the gospel. Throughout the account, Joseph may be the central figure, but his family, especially Judah, draws a prophetic line to the coming Messiah. You see, through Joseph in the book, God is reversing the curse and revealing the blessing. And that is why in Joseph's life, we see a type of Christ, betrayed by his own family, only to one day be in the very position to save many. So as we trace the life of Joseph from a low pit to the high palace, let us learn the lessons and know the blessings of steady obedience to God's promises, regardless of our circumstances. This is Joseph in the book, evil recycled for good. All right, so the further that we have made our way through the account, the harder it becomes to do a review. As you can imagine, there's more details, there's more nuances. We're actually entering into chapter 43 this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there in advance. We're gonna cover the entire chapter. Now, I don't wanna get lost in the details of a review. Then I get lost in the details of a review. But what we have to consider is the pictures that have been laid out before us. You can call them snapshots. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, these pictures. If you know what a photo mosaic is or a mosaic photo, it's a bunch of pictures that make up a larger picture. When you focus in, you see the pictures, the squares in and of themselves. When you focus out, you get to see, like from an aerial view, a greater picture or an image that comes through. Well, that's what's happening. Chapter 37, Joseph and his brothers and their father Jacob betrayed, sold as a slave. At the end of chapter 37, they return home without their brother. They give the coat of many colors to their father. It's drenched in goat blood. Jacob assumes Joseph is dead. Chapter ends. Chapter 38, introduction of Judah. It's as if he goes home and then he leaves his home and starts his own family. In the midst of chapter 38, we see how far off and sinful and selfish Judah is. You gotta mark that because the entire account is about Jacob, not Joseph. So that Joseph could save the family of Jacob, which would eventually preserve the line of Judah because years later, the line of Judah would come through the line of Judah. That's why chapter 38's there. Chapter 39, back to Joseph. He's a slave. He's falsely accused of rape. He ends up in the prison. Chapter 39 ends, chapter 40 begins. Joseph meets two inmates, two officials in the king's court, the baker and the butler. They both have dreams the same night. They wake up, they're disturbed. Joseph notices they're disturbed. Ask them, why are you disturbed? They tell them the dreams. Joseph interprets the dreams. Joseph says to the butler, don't forget about me when you get out of this place. He gets out and forgets about Joseph. Chapter 41 begins. Pharaoh has two dreams. That is when the butler remembers, I know a guy, they summon Joseph, he comes, he interprets the dreams. Chapter 41 ends, chapter 42, this interpretation of the dream involved famine for seven years and then seven years of prosperity. Chapter 42 is when Jacob and the land of Canaan and his family is impacted by the famine. He sends his boys, where? To Egypt. It's when Joseph recognizes his brothers, but the brothers don't recognize Joseph. He deals with them harshly. He's testing them, just as the word of God is testing us. When he sends them home, he takes one of the brothers and keeps him, Simeon. Says, go home if you're telling me the truth and bring back this younger brother you spoke of. They go home. The second time they return home to their dad without a brother. This time they tell him the truth 
about what happened. Dad, we can't go back unless we bring Benjamin. Jacob's faith is on display, or lack thereof. Jacob says, at the very end of chapter 42, he says to his sons, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, Joseph, and he is left alone. Benjamin is all by himself. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you should bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. This is fatalism. This is Jacob who might be entangled by what we could call grief. Now, please go back and listen to that message. At the end of the message, we talked about grief and how many of us are grief stricken. And grief is God given. It's a reminder that life is brief and it also should be the trigger that causes us to look to God for relief or for grace. But often, grief becomes our own God and we surrender and bow to grief as opposed to finding the God of grief and reach out to him for that comfort. Does that make sense? Right, so we're begin with that in mind about grief or pain or affliction or hardship or trial and all of us in this room are going through it. Now here's the question. Do you have the peace of God as you navigate that grief? As you navigate that trial, how do you get the peace of God in the midst of your grief? I'll tell you one thing you do not do. You do not find peace in the midst of grief. And you said, wait, I thought you said you do find peace in the midst of grief. No, you don't find peace in the midst of grief. You let go of the grief and the peace of God finds you. You let go of the struggle, which is the word surrender. And then the peace of God finds you. Here's the verse that I send out to people all the time when they're in the midst of grief. It's Isaiah 26, verse three. You may have received this verse from me. And it says this, you will keep him in perfect peace. You, God, will keep him or her in shalom, shalom, perfect peace, compounded peace. When that individual keeps their mind stayed on him. Watch the exchange. God, you keep them in perfect peace when they keep their mind stayed on you. When my mind is focusing on him in the midst of my trial or my grief, God slaps his peace and stabilizes our soul. That doesn't remove the grief, so to speak, but it gives you this anchor that keeps you stable as you go through it. Now this is what we're gonna see in chapter 43. We're gonna see the stages of surrender in both Jacob and the brothers. Like, that mosaic picture that I just explained earlier, all those little snapshots and individual pictures from chapters 37 all the way to chapter 42 are actually going to make a mosaic in chapter 43. Watch this. Chapter 37 and chapter 38. It's gonna be like those two chapters are now inversed or reversed as they come up in chapter 43. We're gonna read it slow. We're gonna cover a lot of ground. Let's begin. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt that their father said to them, go back, buy us a little food. All right, stop. Timelines are important. In chapter 45, I'm jumping ahead, when Joseph eventually reveals his identity, he says to them, for these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years left. There's your seven. Which tells us that we're within the span of two years, the first two years of the famine. Remember, Joseph was gone from the age of 17 to 30, and then we have the first seven years of the famine. That's, do your math, that's 20. And now we have another two years, that's 22 years since Joseph last left Canaan. 22 years added to this equation, which means within the first year of the famine, Jacob's family is in great need. That's when he would have sent his boys to Egypt, the first year. That's a couple months, half a year, the first year. Within that first year, famine has struck the family. Go get us some grain. That's chapter 42. They go into Egypt. That's the encounter with this mysterious Egyptian ruler who deals harshly with them, who takes Simeon, who sends them home, don't return without your younger brother. That's what's happening. So what happens, they go home, 
We have no idea how long the food lasted. But if the famine was severe, we could say a few months. We could even say an entire year has passed, which means this. Jacob has no concern that Simeon was left in Egypt. <laughs> and even in the statement here, go back and get us more food, he makes no mention of the dire circumstances that his family's in other than he wants them to go get more food. And why do I stop and say it like that? Because it's not true faith, but dire straits that has created the need to go back to that place. And sometimes in our life, it's not necessarily faith that causes us to make our decisions. In fact, it's sometimes just necessity. It's sometimes just the pressure of the circumstances. You're not even looking to God. And yet, God is still providential over even your lack of faith. That's how good this God is that we serve. You might be in a pressure piper, a situation where you have to make a decision, and you're not even looking to God, and it's the pressure of the circumstance that is causing you to make a step, to make a decision. Why is that important? Because we often don't see the complications of life, or what I would say the predicaments of life, as providential. Oh no, we don't want the predicaments. We don't want the complications. We don't want the complexities. We want everything to be predictable. But what we see in the narrative of Joseph is that God's providence is no less perfect in the predicament than in the predictable. Like, some of you go, I met my wife providentially, and then you tease out your story, and it's like, you guys went to grade school together, and you went to middle school together, and you went to high school together, and you went to the same college. What did you expect? Of course you were gonna get married. But that's providential as much as the complications and the predicaments that you don't see God in the midst of. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say we often say God is good when we can predict the outcome of an event. But God is not good when I can't see what he's up to in the midst of the predicament. And I'm saying to you, I would make a biblical argument that the predicament is probably the providence. The predicament is likely the providence. Can you trust God? Now Judah speaks to his father. Remember Reuben spoke in the previous chapter. But Judah spoke to him saying, the man solemnly warned us saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Notice here, he says, the man solemnly warned. It's, it's a double emphasis. It, it means this. Dad, the man warning us warned us. The man warning us warned us we are not to return without our brother. He says it twice. We shall not see his face unless we return with our brother. We cannot go back to Egypt on your terms, Dad. We must go back to Egypt on this Egyptian ruler's terms, Dad. This is remarkable because remember, last time we saw Judah, Genesis 37 and Genesis 38. Genesis 37, Judah was the one, the mind behind the plan to sell Joe as a slave into Egypt. It was Judah, his voice. Let's profit off of him. And then Genesis 38, Judah mishandling his family and not giving his third son to his daughter-in-law, Tamar. Remember that? So she took matters into her own hand, disguised herself as a harlot, met him on the road, and eventually he would lie with his daughter-in-law so that she would become impregnated so she could carry on her family line. And when Judah found out, he was enraged. Remember this? And he said, let's stone her or kill her, for she is a harlot. And what did, what did Tamar do? She sent back the pledge or the surety of that original deal, which was his signet, his cord, and his staff. Oh, if that's what you're gonna do to me, hey, the person who is the father of the baby in my womb owns these items. To which Judah said, remember this? She is more righteous than me. This is probably what begins the submission and surrendering of Judah. What we're seeing is the evolution of Judah. How so? Remember, he sold his brother for money. 
Now he's stepping out to his dad and saying, Dad, we gotta take Benjamin back to save the family. Remember, he lied to Tamar because he wouldn't give up his son. Now he's asking his father to give up his son. You're beginning to see something happen in the heart of Judah. Now watch this, verse six. And Israel said, why do you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you had still another brother? I wonder how many times Jacob asked that question to his boys. But they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, could we have possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? Judah says, we gotta go with Benjamin. That's the only terms. Jacob says, why have you done this evil to me? Jacob is resorting back to his baser nature, his sinful, selfish nature, which is interesting. You might not have called it. Did you see it? In the beginning of chapter, or excuse me, in the, in the beginning of verse six, did you see it? And Israel said, did, did you see that? I thought we were talking about Jacob. Why in the world would the Holy Spirit inspire Moses to actually, in the midst of the narrative, change his name from Jacob to Israel? Oh, it's because God wants us to see something in the midst of this. Even Jacob himself, whose covenantal name was Israel, given by God, he's now having his own type of evolution, his own type of progression. We're eventually gonna see where it leads. But first and foremost, Jacob is basically saying to his boys, none of this would have happened had you not told him the truth. Oh, that's what the word Jacob means. <laughs> Supplanter, deceiver. That's what the name, and of course the nature of this sinner named Jacob, that's what he is all about. We know that because he was able to deceive his father for the birthright. You're going backwards now. Jacob's nature. In Genesis chapter 32, God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. You're no longer deceiver, you're now governor. Governor of God, a governed by God. It also is reiterated in chapter 35. God comes to Jacob and says, you're no longer Jacob. Your name is now Israel, which means governed by God. And in the picture, we're seeing our nature. When we're sinner, like Jacob, we're self-preserving. When we're sinner, we are deceiver. When we are deceiver, we are living for self. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you're living for self, when you're self-preserving, when you're selfish, that's your baser nature. That is your sinful nature. That is your carnal man or woman. That is being like Jacob. However, because of Jesus Christ coming into our life, we become believer. And when you are believer, you're no longer living for self. Oh no, sanctification is about dying to self and being governed by God. The Spirit inspires Moses to write, oh, we're gonna deal with Israel here. And you're gonna see how he's eventually going to be governed by God. Then Judah said to his father Israel, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. Remember, the famine is severe. You're talking about Jacob being selfish, not wanting to send Benjamin back, Judah saying, we have to go back with Benjamin. Dad, don't you see this is a, impacting all of our families? Not just us, not just you, but even our little ones. Now watch Judah. I myself will be shorty for him. That's the same word in Genesis 38. The last time Judah presented a pledge or surety, it was obviously to be a deceiver like his father. And here now, he is presenting a surety or a pledge, and it's himself. You shall, from my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. What was Reuben's presentation to his dad? Let him come. If anything happens to him, you can kill my two sons. <laughs> Let's just add more pain and more grief to the family. Judah is actually saying, I'll put my life on the line. 
This is the complete opposite of what we've learned of Judah thus far. Last time Judah presented himself, it was for self-gratification in Genesis 38. Here in Genesis 43, it's for family preservation. Dad, my life for Benjamin's life. Now this is obviously easier said than done, but guess what we're gonna see in the next chapter? We're gonna see this being tested in Judah, whether or not he's willing to put his life on the line like he said. And their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man. Take the fruits from our land and take a present, including a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double money in your hand Take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise, go back to the man. Verse 14, and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. All right, a lot has just happened in these few verses. Jacob is finally stating, all right, I'm ready to release Benjamin. But before you go back, make for yourselves a present to give to this man. That's interesting because Jacob has done this once before. When there was a conflict between him and his brother Esau in Genesis 32 and 33, when he was worried about Esau, reports were Esau's returning, Jacob, or excuse me, Jacob was fearful, he he presented gifts to go before him to appease perhaps the wrath or anger of his brother. He's resorting to the very things he's done in his past to appease the wrath or the anger of somebody. He did it with Esau and he's attempting to do it here. Now, note this, chapter 37, when we're told that Joseph is taken as a slave and on his way to Egypt with an Ishmaelite caravan, it's interesting Moses highlights the product that was in that caravan. You know some of the products that were in that caravan in chapter 37? You can read it. Myrrh, spices, and balm. In other words, the last time the caravan of people with Joseph were going into Egypt, they had these very same items. And now Jacob is putting these items together to go from Canaan back to Egypt Of course, all these items, in fact, I don't know if you know this, fruits, organic from the land, balm, honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio nuts, almonds, all these organic delights was the inspiration behind the grocery store Trader Joe's. Did you know that? Actually, that's not true at all. (laughs) But it sounds like it could be. Go down and trade with that guy. His name's Joe, Trader Joe's. (laughs) He ends with a prayer, and he states in verse 14, and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may release your brother. Jacob is like, which brother again did we leave behind in Egypt? Like, he's not mentioning Simeon for some reason. But he, he uses this covenantal name of God. Don't miss this. Oh, the first time we are introduced to the almighty God, El Shaddai, in the original language, it's Genesis 17. And it is God identifying himself to who? Abraham. I am almighty God, and I'm gonna establish a covenant with you, Abraham, and through your loins, I'm gonna produce nations. This was the covenant name of God shown out with Abraham, and guess where it shows up again? Covenant name of God, when Abraham's son Isaac is blessing his son Jacob, and he orients his son's attention to the Almighty God. When does this show up again? Oh, it shows up again when God visits Jacob and reminds him that he's going to make a nation through him, just like he said to Abraham, just like he said to Isaac. Now, as much as this sounds good, You can read the lines. You don't have to read between the lines. You can read the lines. Who is he saying this to? Who is Jacob saying this to? Is he saying it to God? No. 
He's not, he's saying it to his boys. Does that make it less potent? No, but it just shows you where his heart is. And he ends not with, so be it. He ends with, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. In other words, it is what it is. What am I trying to get you to understand here? Well, in Genesis chapter 32, the last time he was under pressure and he put a gift together to send to his brother Esau, notice what he, what he does, ready? Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies, same word, and all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, he's, he's bringing Almighty God into He's bringing God into attention of his word. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. Is that what we see here in Genesis 43? Oh, no, it's not. Which means he's still coming up short. When he was in the original pressure with his brother, he is like, God, I need your mercy. I need you to spare me. I need you to deliver me. Well, here he's saying to his boys, hey, it's like, hey, may God bless you. May God's will be done in you. And what will be, will be. In other words, it's faith and fatalism and faith and fatalism don't mix. It's true what he's saying. May God be merciful. May the almighty God who gave a covenant to my family spare us and deliver us. It's true, the platitude is true, but the attitude underneath it is false. Well, how many of us can quote and regurgitate the Christianese? How many of us? We know what to say. How many of us, in the midst of our own circumstances or others, are quick to give advisement, advisements and Bible verses and, hey, God's gonna bless you through this, but we don't actually even believe it. Oh, the platitude be true, but the attitude underneath of it is actually false. How do you know that you've actually trusted God with your circumstances and left the consequences to him? There's gonna be a peace and a faith, not fear. Not if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. That might sound like, you know what? I'm willing to settle with whatever happens. That's not what he's saying here. He is resorting back to that grief-stricken state. Though he has made the right platitude, it's his attitude that God is after. So the men took that present and Benjamin, verse 15, and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. Don't miss that. It says the men, right? So that's the brothers. There's 10 of them plus Benjamin. That makes 11 of them. But the 10 are to take their money and then the double of the money. The word money here is the same word that shows up in Genesis 37 as the word silver, same words. How much did they sell Joseph for? 20 shekels of silver. If they go down with their original pouches of money and there's 10 of them, how many pouches do they have? 10. If they're told to take double the money, now they have two pouches in each hand and there's 10 of them, 10 times two is what? 20. They sold their brother for 20 pieces of silver and now they're returning to Egypt with 20 bags of silver. It's like God is like, I got perfect retribution. They take Benjamin, they stand before Joseph, verse 16, Joseph sees Benjamin with them. He says to the steward of his house, take these men to my home, slaughter an animal and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. 
Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Then the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may make a case against us and seize us and take us as slaves with our donkeys. <laughs> this is exactly what they did to Joseph for money. A guilty conscience needs no accuser. Remember from last week, point number one, how off they are about what God is up to? A guilty conscience will think bad of good providence. They are actually resorting to the original mistake that was made. They were honest in the business transaction. Joseph gave them their money back. On the journey, one of the brothers discovered the money. It says that their hearts failed them. They were terrified. In the midst of them discovering the money, they said this, what is this that God has done to us? Now they're being invited into Joseph's house and they're saying, this is because he's gonna make a case against us. Everybody knew a very affluent leader like this Egyptian ruler would have a dungeon in his house, in his basement. So now they're at the edge of the door and they're assuming we're only here because this ruler is going to punish us. They have a guilty conscience and yet they're getting a little bit closer to the confession that Joseph is bringing them to. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, oh sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. There it is. Hey, before we go into Joseph's house, this house, they're begging and pleading with the steward. Per chance, the steward would go back and tell his master about their predicament. Watch what the steward says. But he said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. There's a lot happening here. First and foremost, full disclosure, full confession by the brothers. What's the result of full disclosure, being honest, being truthful, being transparent? What's the result of this type of confession? It says peace. You have no reason to fear. No peace, shalom. And then he brings out Simeon, restoration. For the Christian, full disclosure, full confession always leads to peace and always leads to restoration. That's point number one. Again, we're seeing the brothers progress towards repentance. Another thing that, that's worth noting is that in Genesis 42, 28, remember their initial response about the money discovery was what has God done to us? What is this that God has done to us? Here's the answer. It's like God is correcting their theology. You think God is out to get you? Out of the mouth of the steward? Put that together. What has God done to us? The mouth of the steward answers, no, no, your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. The phrase is hidden treasure. That God is blessing them. It's a compliment to their faith. But they should receive it as an indictment for their lack of faith. It's as if the steward, by the way, is likely a foreigner in the house of Joseph. It's as if he's saying to them, don't you know your God? The God of your father? Don't, don't you know that he's a God who blesses? What does the steward know about this Hebrew God? Whatever Joseph has shared with him, which is another lesson to behold that even in Joseph's house in a foreign land, he has not forgotten the God of his fathers and has even 
influenced his steward and his servant in his house to know his God. And for all of us, an incorrect view of God, an incorrect view of God, it will infect your view of the world. You know, starting from their actual circumstances, they can't see God in the midst of this. They think God is out to get them. He is not God who is a father. He's the God father. He is out to, to deal with them based on their past. They're completely missing the blessings in the midst of their, their situation. They have an incorrect view of God. And you can't have an incorrect view of God without that incorrect view infecting, contaminating, poisoning your perspective and your view of your world and the world. I could take the rest of the week and tease out that one line from what we've seen over the past several years, incorrect views of God, which has led to infectious views of the world and situations. But we don't have time. Verse 24 and 26. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys feed. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. Again, they're bowing. This is the fulfillment fully of his dream from Genesis 37. Why? Because the one dream had 11 stars. Now there are 11 brothers, and they're bowing down to this mysterious leader in fulfillment of that dream. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, verse 27, is your father well? The old man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? And they answered, your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. They are now on their knees, on their faces, and they are bowing like this. Now, don't miss what just happened. The steward says, peace be to you, shalom. Don't fear, your God and the God of your father, this covenant God, he's the one that gave you hidden treasure. Oh, by the way, true to the master's word, here's Simeon. They then begin to prepare this present. Remember this present that had fruits and myrrh and spices. That's all they were concerned about because now they want to appease perhaps the wrath of this Egyptian ruler. So they got to give a gift because the gift would op obviously be the means by which they would gain favor. So they're putting this gift together and here comes Joseph. And I can imagine they got this, this exaggerated fruit basket and Joseph doesn't even bring it up. Oh no. He sees them and he asks them, how are you doing? He asks about their well-being, it says. And then he asks, how's your father doing? The present meant nothing to Joseph. The present meant everything to Joseph. You were like, you just contradicted yourself, pastor. Oh no, I didn't. Listen to what I'm saying. The present, the gift, the goods, meant nothing. To Joseph, the present, the time, is my father good? That meant everything to Joseph. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin and his mother's son and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep and he went into his chamber and wept there. This is the second time Joseph has wept. Last time he saw Benjamin, he was likely three years old. Some suggest three to seven years old. Benjamin is probably in his mid-20s here, late 20s, early 30s at the latest. Joseph is overwhelmed with compassion. God be gracious to you, my son. That was a Hebrew blessing. These are subtle hints that this ruler standing before them is more than they know. Notice Jacob's prayer, may God Almighty be merciful to you. Joseph to his brother Benjamin, God be gracious to you. The steward to the brothers, God give you his peace. And we have the theological trinity of grace, mercy, and peace, all of which are gifts given by a good God. But more than that, 
in the midst of this, as Joseph is overwhelmed with mercy, the same word that we saw in the prayer from verse 14, said by Jacob as a best wish, that may God Almighty be merciful, is the same word used here in verse 30, that Joseph is overwhelmed with mercy. It's the prayers of Jacob, though they were more fatal than faith, that are coming to fulfillment in the heart of Joseph, extended it to his brother Benjamin. It's remarkable. God's mercy. And this whole presentation thus far is the very point of the parable that we would come to know as the prodigal son. If you read through Luke chapter 15, did you catch this? The prodigal son, the lost son, he rehearses his prayer. He comes home. The father sees him and is, it says, moves moved with compassion, mercy, runs at him, hugs him, kisses him, turns to his steward and says, kill the fatted calf. We're gonna have a party. This is what's happening. Though they don't know it, they're invited to the master's table. They come with their good works and their gift and all of that meant nothing because what Joseph was after was their heart. And it's a picture of the beautiful gospel. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is not merit-based. It's always mercy-driven. Did you get that? And how many of us think we have to come to God and appease him? And Jesus already did that. Jesus already appeased the wrath of the Father by taking upon himself your sin and my sin and leaving in the place of his sacrifice mercy, keeping you from what you do deserve, peace, with the Father and grace, giving you what you don't deserve. We do not have to work our way into God's love. No, God's love did all the work necessary on Calvary. He's weeping. It says he washes his face, comes out, restrains himself, and says, serve the bread. So they set him a place by himself, Joseph and them by themselves, the 11 brothers, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, three tables, because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egypt, the Egyptians. Don't miss this. Again, this is a foreshadow of the reason God would bring the children of Israel into Egypt. Egypt was very divided, but they certainly would not mingle or marry these foreigners known as Jews or Hebrews. It was as if God was gonna take the Israelites They'd become a large people through the book of Exodus, and they'd be in the furnace of Egypt. Why? Because God was preparing his people while he was preparing the land for his people. And it's simultaneous. And, and, and here, separation from the Egyptian culture prevented assimilation into the culture. God always knows what he's doing. They also should take note, why is this mysterious Egyptian leader taking interest in our father and our brother and our welfare? And why is he not sitting at the table with the other Egyptians? Like, there's so many subtle hints that this guy is somebody other than who he is saying he is. Then they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth, and the men looked in astonishment at one another. <laughs> They're sitting according to their birthright. Joseph has them sitting from the youngest in order all the way to the eldest, from Benjamin to Reuben, and they're looking at each other, and they are blown away. Now, some geek statistically put this together that the odds of putting 11 brothers in their chronological order is one in 40 million. Very unlikely. Then he took servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. They had a party. Benjamin gets five times more than his brothers. Of course, this is perfect provision and mercy and grace to Benjamin. But perhaps it's also Joseph testing the brothers because the last time the youngest received favor from a father became the point of contention and envy that caused them to sell Joseph as a slave. Maybe Joseph is seeing how they respond 
when the youngest son of their father, whose mother was Rachel, receives favor from somebody else. It's how we end chapter 43. And very quickly, with so many other lessons to, to learn, I'm gonna run through three practical ways that you and I, like the brothers, in proximity to Joseph, are progressing in our surrender. How do you do that? No matter how long you've been a Christian, what are the three things you do in order to get back into the peace of God? Well, the first thing you do, <clears throat> number one, you own your guilt. You stop making excuses. You own your life. You own your circumstances. No longer playing the blame game. Guys, no longer justifying your bad decisions, your sinful decisions. You don't have to justify them. Jesus does that. Own your guilt. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you from your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Own your guilt. No excuses. Own your guilt. Now think in light of our communion that we're gonna take. Owning your guilt, right? Well, the second thing you do, because this is another struggle, is you disown your regret. Own your guilt, I'm a sinner, I confess my sins. Then there's these things in your past that you regret. And we easily go backwards and say, had I not done this, that wouldn't have led to that. But you can't change your past. So regret is never good. Don't let anybody ever convince you. I have people ask me all the time, do you regret what you did? Of course you want me to say yes. But it's a ridiculous question because I can't go backwards and change what I did in my past. And if I try to, I'm basically saying I know more than what God allowed. So no, I own my guilt. I disown my regret. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. That which has produced godly sorrow in you, that causes a change of mind, like we're seeing in the brothers, that's salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. You know what the sorrow of the world is? Regret. Number three, ladies and gentlemen, if you learn to own your guilt, no excuses. You begin to disown your regret. Number three, you begin to hone in on grace. Hone in on grace, focus in on grace. Unmerited favor, the gift of God, given in spite of you. Given freely. The writer of Hebrews chapter 12 verse one tells us, that we're surrounded with a cloud of witnesses. So why not run the race with endurance that's set before you? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who led this life a sinless one, went to the cross for your sin so you can own your guilt, ordained everything in your life so you can disown your regret, accomplish what he came to do, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father so you can now hone in on grace. I mean, when we take communion, is that not what we're expressing? Like the body and the blood. Man, my life and everything that I've been through and everything that I've done up to this moment, up to the present moment, God, I own it. I own my past, I own my shortcomings, I own my sinfulness, I own my guilt. No more excuses. No more justifying. I am a sinner. I do not deserve to be called your son or daughter. I own it. And then this thing happens inside your soul. And then you say, you know, I'm gonna disown all the regret that I have. Everything that has happened to me, everything that I've done, I disown it. I am no longer giving it space, no longer giving it time. I'm no longer thinking backwards. I'm looking forward. I disown my regret. And now, God, the moment that my heart longs for, I wanna hone in on your grace. 
And there's coming a day in the life of Joseph's brothers and even in Jacob where there's full restoration. And all because God had a perfect plan to send before them a savior. And a savior who would suffer to get to a position and a point that would eventually turn to them and give them the salvation that they did not deserve. Joseph had every right in the midst of this story to take them as slaves because that's what they made him. But he doesn't. He does it because God had a better plan. So as we take the elements together, I'll give you a second to rip off the top. Jesus, in what we call the Last Supper, was really the institution of communion in light of celebrating Passover, right? And he was pointing to himself, basically saying, I'm the fulfillment of Passover. And that blood that has been shed in the sacrificial system, that pointed to my blood. And my body is eventually gonna be broken for you, he said to his disciples. And he took this moment with his disciples that would be instituted by the church, that every time we come together and we take communion, we're doing so to bring our lives in remembrance of what Jesus did, his death and his eventual return. That's what this symbolizes. Not to be taken lightly, none of it. And I think physically speaking, materially speaking, as it's in my hand, you need to set aside a, a, a space in your heart right now to do business with God, you, with all eyes bowed, closed, Father, we, we present our bodies before you, broken and sinful and weak as they are, fragile, fearful, regretful as they are. And we trust that your body broken is greater than all of our sins and all of our regrets and all of our shame. And your body broken perfectly for the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of souls. So we take and we eat accordingly. And take and eat as you feel led. Father, likewise, we partake in this cup, this juice, this wine, this symbolic blood that covers us, that completes us, that allows us to be free. And we do so with seriousness of heart and mind. And we thank you, oh God, for your grace, your mercy, and your peace as the outcome. It's your blood. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, we do this. We take and you drink as you feel led. So God, let it be so. We praise you and we thank you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.